very good evening to everyone. Hope you, you and your family are safe. I know these are testing times for the entire country and uh, for the world. And I'm hoping that uh, as we do this session, um, all of you are safe and your families are safe. Uh, we, we do understand uh, that this is probably not the right time to do this session, uh, but we took a call uh, to go ahead with it uh, to ensure that all the students who are applying or, or need information uh, are, should not uh, be sort of left behind. So uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining in. And thank you so much uh, to all uh, my esteemed panelists uh, for being with us uh, here today. I'm really honored uh, uh, in a way to be sort of doing this session because uh, uh, it is the first time that I am moderating them because I'm used to being moderated by uh, them all this while uh, having studied uh, you know, in their uh, classes. Uh, professor Jarding uh, was my professor for campaign management at Kennedy School, as well as my uh, professor for how to run for office. Uh, whatever little I know about politics and campaign is, is thanks to him. He's been my mentor for the last uh, three, three and a half years as well. Uh, and he's a global campaign consultant. Uh, uh, you know, he's done campaigns across 40, political campaigns across 40 countries. Uh, he's one of the most decorated campaign managers in the world. And we're very proud uh, to have him at Kautalya as our one of our advisory board members and also one of our faculty members. Uh, a very uh, warm welcome to you, Professor Steve Jarding. Uh, then I have uh, Professor Moshik Temkin, uh, another one of my professors who I learned a lot from and uh, who sort of uh, decorated in a way that uh, China wants him, uh, you know, more than United States. He's one of the advisors to the Schwarzman program, apart from being uh, associate professor of public policy and leadership at uh, Harvard Kennedy School. Again, somebody who every bureaucrat in India goes and learns from. Uh, that's his trademark. All the bureaucrats in India do take his classes. His classes uh, are uh, more to do with uh, how do you sort of look at comparative politics, leadership, and uh, leaders from a you know history of how they acted during uh, you know times. He's written books on the famous Sako uh, Vanzati uh, uh, you know uh, crisis, and and he sort of teaches leadership through uh, you know uh, the lens of how the leader reacted and acted according to that situation, right? Another very interesting class and very sought after class at the Kennedy School. He is also uh, you know advising us on setting up of the school and and should have a formal uh, agreement with us pretty soon. We're excited to welcome him at Cortelia as well. Uh, and last but not the least, and and one of my sort of uh, courses which sort of I'm really looking to do learn again uh, because I couldn't take writing at uh, Harvard Kennedy School but with Professor Glenn uh, Cremon coming to India I'm hoping to sit in class uh, more than the students right because uh, he teaches uh, this course called winning writing at Stanford School of Business at the Stanford uh, University in the United States and also is uh, you know uh, has been the editor of New York Times for a quarter of a century and has mentored more than 10 Pulitzer Prize winners. So, you know, uh, if you're looking to win a Pulitzer, I would say this is uh, the, the man and this is the course you ought to take. Uh, so so uh, the, the only problem with uh, running a star-studded panel is that you won't have enough time. So I've given them very tight slots to actually talk about various facets of public policy. Uh, again, to set the context, why are we doing this session for you? We're doing this because we fundamentally believe that you are the next generation public policy leaders in India and the best help possible in terms of knowledge, skills and networks ought to be given to you to actually ensure that you are set up for success in the field of public policy. And the Cotelia School of Public Policy's endeavor is to bring the best professors from across the world to you and actually give you that Ivy League education right here in India, in Hyderabad, at a fraction of a cost, right? So we're trying to remove all the barriers which stand between you and change and ensuring that you get access to the best in the world. And today, as you can see, you've got the access to the best in the world. These are the people who run uh, the public policy across the world. So without further ado, I am not going to be speaking. Uh, now I'm going to be handing over the mic to my esteemed panelists. And I'll start off with the first question. My, you know, I want to understand in the opening remarks from Professor Jarding, Professor Glenn and Professor Temkin is, you know, why is this masters in public policy relevant to India and the globe, right? Why is there a strong case for MPP in the country, right? What can Indians do uh, and should do uh, you know, from this uh, master's in public policy degree. So, Professor Jarding, if you can start uh, start us off today. 
Yeah, no, I'm happy to, and, and thank you for all that are participating. It's uh, it's an honor to uh, be in front of you. And uh, now, uh, to me, it's 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 kind of a, a a simple answer, right? I mean, India, uh, 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 well, three four years ago became the fifth largest economy. I think today it's the third largest economy in the world. Um, I, I really, in in my travels and my uh, work and campaigns, have. It, not that it wasn't obvious uh, to most of us, but it certainly became obvious to me as I was working in so many countries around the world that the 21st century is going to be dominated by three or four nations, uh, certainly China, uh, the United States, uh, but I think India. Uh, uh, India is kind of the the unknown player. It's, it's uh, again, the third largest economy. It's got, to, it's, it's moving very rapidly um, forward in its technology and its capacity to, to influence. It's also a very strategic nation. Um, you know, maybe you could throw in a Brazil or maybe you throw in the European Union, but, but I think the 21st century is largely going to be shaped by the United States, China, and India. And, I, and, I, and again, India, in many ways, is a great unknown. So a school of public policy that trains and brings next generation leaders to the world stage, uh, I think is absolutely critical. I mean, India has to play an important role. Obviously, the US and China have their own issues. But India becomes that, that kind of wild card that, that has the capacity to affect change in such a dramatic way. But it needs to have uh, individuals who are trained in public policy who understand the critical role in which India plays. And um, I, I know from my work in India, and I've worked in campaigns in India, there still seems to be almost a hesitancy, at least from my perspective, uh, amongst Indians who are, you know, how do we play this? How, what, how do we take this mantle as one of the world leaders and, and influence? And I think the a school of public policy of the of the quality of, of Katilia is so critical to moving India uh, into that uh, rightful place that they've earned as one of the great uh, leaders in the world. And, 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 and I would even put a finer point, I think it is fundamental. I really do believe that the world needs India to step up. The world, it's the largest democracy, we all know that, but India has to step up. It has to put pressure on its government to perform. If they don't, I think we're going to have a critical void uh, where very often you're gonna get China and the US at each other's throats. And that's not good for, for uh, uh, international policy. We need a, a powerful player coming from India. And that's why the School of Public Policy, I think is critical to train next generation leaders. Thank you so much for getting us started, uh, Steve. I mean, I can't really stress more about the fact that look at the given pandemic, right? I mean, where are the next generation public policy leaders getting us out of this pandemic? I mean, we are running helter-skelter for basic things such as oxygen, beds, ICUs, ventilators, medicines, right? Uh, I mean, why, why is there so much chaos, right? If there was uh, there were public policy leaders uh, in charge, right? We could have probably had a better situation. So I can't really stress more about the fact uh, how contextually uh, relevant it is at this given point to have public policy leaders. Uh, Professor uh, Glenn, if you uh, wanna uh, you know, step in now and share your thoughts on why do you think uh, India needs uh, Kautalya and why do you think India needs its graduates to do public policy? Pratik, I think you mentioned the most important uh, word, which is coronavirus. And in the United States, we've seen that no matter what your politics, you can see what happens when people who know public policy are running the country. And you can see what happens when people who don't know public policy are running the country. And I pray that India will turn around very much as the United States has. We still have lots of problems. But India needs more robust public policy programs. Uh, I wish Stanford had a, a stronger one. Where I work, Harvard has a much, a much better one. Here's why, whether in the US or India, we need more bridges between the public sector and the private sector. We need more people who understand how government works and how the private sector works and how they can work together. And I wish companies had more people who understand government. And I wish government had more people who understand companies. The best MPP programs like Cotillia will connect government and the private sector. Yeah, I think uh, 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 having worked uh, across, uh, so in, in at Kennedy, we call it the tri-sector experts, right? 
whether you're able to navigate through government, civil society, and the private sector. And I think people at the uh, who can understand these three sectors and sort of can make them work together uh, at this point. For example, right now, civil society, uh, you know, is not being brought onto the table like it should have been because the last mile delivery failures can be sort of addressed if you have civil society working in tandem with the government, right? So, so I, I totally understand that, you know, how do you make private sector, government and civil society work in tandem uh, is, is going to be the next challenge for the leaders in India. And I, I sort of shift my uh, focus on to Professor Temkin, right? Uh, Professor Temkin, right? Uh, what sort of, uh, you know, political leaders, what sort of a, you know, how are you saying the politics of the country and the world changing? And, and where do you see the masters in public policy students, which you train at Kautalya on, on, on politics and leadership, right? How do you see that, uh, you know, them taking uh, their rightful place in the country? You've taught many students from India, like myself, right? What is it that we can do to change the status quo in India? Well, first, Pratik, I want to thank you for inviting me to this panel. I'm thrilled to see everybody, and it's really an honor uh, to speak to, to, to your audience. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm very excited. I think this is an extremely exciting initiative. I want to say it uh, right, right away uh, before I even say anything uh, of, of, of substance. Uh, but to, to answer your question, it's enough to just look around you. Uh, we, you know, I teach uh, leadership in history, as, as you point out, and leaders in history are measured according to how they act in crisis, uh, how they act when, the, when times are very difficult. And uh, we are in such a moment, right? It feels like we're always in such a moment, but right now it really feels quite acute and dangerous. And we know if we've learned anything in the past year, we know that what happens in one part of the world will affect uh, our other parts of the world. And I think uh, one thing that is very important for us to emphasize when we look at public policy and when we talk about leadership is really how we are in this together, right? Uh, and so I emphasize the idea of public service, right? Public service, not just as, a, you know, as an abstract idea, but actually to make it, to make it work. Um, and I've had, as you point out, many uh, students uh, from, from India over the years um, they've come to Harvard, they've taken our classes, they've been excellent, and you, you among them, Pratik. But I think it's time that India had its own uh, way of doing this right at home, right? We can't keep up this model of, you know, just uh, the lucky few who are able to travel, right? It's uh, increasingly, it's expensive and going to be increasingly difficult, right? Uh, and as my colleagues point out, you know, India is so important and going to be even more important. So I think Atilia is coming in right at the right time. Right? And it's the right moment uh, and extremely important for us to understand this isn't just about careers, although that's important. It isn't just about individual opportunity, though that's important, but it's really about uh, creating a culture, a culture of good public policy and leadership. And I think that it, it really starts here. Great. Uh, so that's sort of uh, the opening remarks. Uh, now I would want to delve into, you know, a deeper into the subjects you mastered in and you've been teaching for uh, you know, number of years to your students, right? And I'll start with Professor Glenn now. Professor Glenn, uh, tell us what is winning writing and why is writing so important uh, in this present context and how does it open up a, a, a successful career in public policy? Pratik, I'm, I'm so glad that Cotillia has the presence of mind to add a writing program. I think Steve said that, I'm not sure that Harvard does yet. Stanford does. Uh, Typically, graduate schools pay a lot of attention to spoken communication, but you can demonstrate that you're an inspiring and constructive leader through the way you write, not just the way you speak. And also you can refine what you will say by writing it first. So I hope to help Cotillia students improve on their voice uh, my background is I've spent four decades as a journalist. At the Times, I oversaw about 350 editors and 400 reporters across the newspaper. And my job there, more than anything, was to help people tell compelling stories that interest and persuade an audience. And in recent years, I realized how much all of you can benefit from the same lessons that the Times journalists have learned. So I teach practical writing. That's emails and memos. Emails to people you don't know. We call them cold call letters, asking for a job or a favor or money. Pitching to a journalist. 
writing opinion pieces. The students love that, and a number of them have been published in national publications. That's how you extend your voice on public policy. Writing talks and speeches, responding to difficult questions, and that's whether from in a journalist or from your colleagues or your employees. And all told, I've taught about 2,000 business students at Stanford over the past eight years. And why do they take my class? They give me about four reasons. Uh, one, they want to write more concisely. And oh, by the way, that's a big issue for the Indian students. They must write more concisely. They want to write with less effort. It takes them, they sit down to write an email and it takes them 15 minutes to write a three sentence email. It shouldn't. They want to write with more powerful power and influence. And that really is important in public policy because nobody has to listen to you in public policy. You're not their boss. So you need to be persuasive. And then the most fun part is they haven't written in five or 10 years. Many of you have been doing lots of other things. You like to write, you just haven't had a chance to flex those muscles. And so I would say among the 2000 students I've had are perhaps 100 to 200 who are either from India or whose parents came from India after uh, the United States, thank God, opened its borders in 1965. And uh, I do think their biggest challenge, especially the students who still live in India, is to be much more concise in their writing and more informal in their writing, more conversational. And that's what I will push you on uh, in my class. And then the other thing I hope you find is you learn to amplify your voice, whether with your colleagues or society at large, and I try to make it fun. We do a lot of laughing in my classroom, whether it's online or in person. Thanks, Pratik. That's that's great, Professor Glenn. I'll I'll, I'll share one of the experience. So I, I when I was at the Kennedy School, I wrote an open letter to the Prime Minister of the country, right, without thinking uh, the ramifications of what will happen, right. And this was closely when the demonetization had happened in India. It was a global event which happened in India. Everybody was talking about it, and I wrote a, a sort of an op-ed or rather an open letter. And uh, I did not had not taken any class because that class which happens at the Kennedy School only takes 15 students, right? It's a great class by, uh, you know, a uh, famous New York Times, uh, you know, uh, uh, professor again. But again, I had to, you know, bid all my points onto Professor Jarding's class who's sitting here. All 900 of my points for co shop <laughs> went on that. But I still drove the, you know, the, the whatever little experience I had to writing that open letter, right? And, uh, you know, uh, Prime Minister of this country had said that, hard work is more important than Harvard, right? That you, you know, you need to work hard. You don't need a degree like uh, Harvard, right? And I wrote an open letter. It got published in 20 different languages in the country. And next I know I was doing primetime shows uh, with the top journalists in the country, right? Wow. So I, I realized the power of writing, right? And and that's by accident, right? What you're going to teach students at Kautalya is how do, you, how do they do day in and day out, right? We have some of uh, the journalists who probably are on uh, listening in, who have tuned in, uh, to listen from you. And I'm, I'm really excited that all the journalists in India get a fresh perspective on how can they sort of hold the government accountable in, in, a, in a way that in, it's not personal. It's, it's about the policy. It's about the evidence. It's about amplifying their voice, right? And that's what's important. And I'm really, really grateful that you're going to be teaching winning writing at, uh, you know, uh, Kautelia. Now I would love to shift gears on to leadership uh, and uh, leaders in history, right? Professor Temkin, right? How... A, you know, why do you think this course can be taught in India, right? Why do you think understanding of the politics from a lens of what other countries have gone through, how democracies are behaving across the world is important in, in India's context? And how would you sort of contextualize and bring that course into India, into Kotalia? Excellent question, Pratik. So as, as, as you know, I'm a, I'm a historian and I strongly believe uh, that history is our foundation for understanding who we are, uh, wh what are, why our world looks the way it is. Uh, I believe that public policy has that at its core, that it's a good public servant or anyone, you know, either in the private sector, in the public sector, you're in government, in any field, uh, the stronger your foundation of historical knowledge, uh, the better that you understand where we are situated, why things happen the way they did, 
and especially how change happens over time. So that's where I'm coming from. And this is, this is really the basis of my experience teaching history in a, in a public policy school and a public policy setting. And then specifically, what I highlight in my courses is the issue of, of, of leadership. So there are many ways to examine leadership. There is national leadership, there is small scale leadership, there is community leadership, there's leadership in public sector, private sector, social movements, uh, business, et cetera, right? All kinds of different kinds of leadership. Um, and when we look at leadership examples from the past, when we see how leaders in the past, whether it's in the United States, in India, China, wherever it is, how they uh, handled challenges, difficult situations, it's not going to be exactly the way it is today, but we can learn a lot, right? We know that we are not alone in this world, right? That we have antecedents, uh, precedents uh, for, for things that happen, right? Um, and I think there's a reason why, to be perfectly honest with you, Pratik, why when I, uh, all the years I've been teaching um, at, the, at the Kennedy School at Harvard, uh, the Indian, you know, the Indian students came to my classes because I think that they were able to see the relevance um, of what I was talking about, even if it was outside of India, also to the Indian context. And the reason for that, Pratik, is because I believe that public service is the same wherever you are. The idea and leadership is really the same wherever you are. Leadership doesn't mean just being in it for yourself. It doesn't mean just success or making a lot of money. Leadership means doing good, right? Leaving this world, leaving your community in better shape than we found it, right? Standing for something. Right, working for the public good. I really believe that that's the way out of our current uh, crisis. And I think that those are the sorts of things that we can learn from uh, leadership in history. Amazing, amazing. So, so I'm really, really looking forward. I'll tell you, uh, you know, when I read about the, so, so I'll, I'll share an instance from my classroom with uh, Professor Temkin. Uh, we started debating about Ambedkar, right? And the caste system in Professor Temkin's class, right? And you should have seen how all the Indian students lit up, right? Because the issue of caste and uh, Ambedkar and, uh, you know, the prevailing situation in India about lynching and stuff came in, right? And this was the time when lynching was happening uh, back home in India, right? And I could see that, you know, but, but you know what was the refreshing part about uh, doing it in, in Harvard and not in India is nobody started trading blows with each other, right? The Dalits and the Brahmins and the minorities, everybody was, you know, talking evidence, talking with facts, right? Trying to debate in a civilized manner, right? With all the parliamentary language in place, right? And 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 I often joke with uh, Professor Temkin, right? When we go outside of the classroom, right? We were back to fighting, right? Yes, that, <laughs> that I remember very vividly because in the <laughs> class, what happens is people don't fight each other because they're all united against me, the professor, right? <laughs> I'm the authority figure. Uh, that then it's great, but then when they, everybody was very nice, and I even had everybody applaud the politeness of the Indian students having a respectful discussion. Five minutes later, I walk into the cafe, and it was chaos. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's good. That means that there is discussion. That means that people are thinking about what they're studying, uh, and I believe that these are reflection. People still remember this years after. I think in a very positive and constructive way, and that's how we build the foundation for thinking about leadership in the long term. And I think, I think if you go across universities in India and talk, I'm talking about the best universities in India as well. I think this debate is missing. I think we divide it, uh, we divide across caste, religion, ideology so much that we miss that there is a debate to be had. There are nuances to be brought to the table. And I think I'm so glad that all three of you are going to bring those nuances into the classroom that at the Kautalya, right? Because, uh, you know, what what the difference I got, I mean, if had I not studied in your classes, right, I would have been on this side, you know, fighting and, you know, uh, trying to bring in my ideology, my biases into the picture. But you gave us that framework to think across logic, across and bring out the nuances without losing the fact that there is politeness, there is, you know, there is this debate which, which can take place without uh, noise, right? And that's what we aim to bring at Kautalya. Uh, and that's the education, uh, you know, rather higher education in itself will change the, with, with the way uh, you all will teach uh, at Kautali. And so I'm very excited to sort of see uh, how that plays out and especially how the Ambedkar debate plays out in the classroom in India. 
right? And and now, uh, I mean, uh, you know, Professor Steve, right? Uh, yesterday, you and I were talking about how Prashant Kishore ran a magical campaign uh, in in West Bengal, right? And and stood up against all odds and defeated, uh, uh, you know, one of the biggest political machineries the world has seen, right? So so and these are the things we used to talk about in class, right? So please tell us. How is campaign management going to change the lives of public policy professionals, and why campaign management is a route to change, right? And how uh, can people run for office? Uh, learning from you, right? Because there are some people out here who actually want to become politicians, right? Who don't have the tools, who feel that money, muscle power, and the muck, you know, is required, you know, to to get into politics. How do you sort of give them confidence that campaign management and running for office is the answer? Well, first of all, if, if if you're going to be a great nation, you, you have to understand the, the the role of service. I believe, and and too often in politics, uh, politicians believe that service is about them. And and, and the fact is, and I tell my students all the time, public service is not about those who serve; it's about those who would be served. Um, that you have to understand, and it goes to the concept of of leadership, and 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 and, and so the the idea is give people skills uh, to be successful, and. Over, I've, I've now consulted and managed in 45 countries around the world, uh, uh, many races in the US. Politics is very similar, uh, voter contact, voter persuasion. It really is not very different anywhere in the world. The, the tools may be a little bit different, the culture may be different, but the idea of how you communicate to people and how you do that voter contact, voter persuasion, voter turnout is very uniform. And so over uh, my career of, of 40 years in politics and about 30 in teaching, um, I developed, a, it's about a 300 page campaign plan um, that I use in campaigns all over the world. And I adjust it constantly. It, it's, it's a living document, but basically it, it, what I found is a lot of people in the world say, I won't get into pu electoral public service because I don't know how. Um, I don't know how to run a campaign. I don't know how to raise money. I don't know how to communicate. I don't know how to message. It's a lot easier than you think. And my goal is to give next generation leaders the tools so they can say, okay, this is easier than I thought. I can do this. I can, I mean, I believe that, you know, we talk a lot about disenfranchising voters, um, uh, you know, keeping them from voting. I think we disenfranchise candidates almost more than voters um, in that you either have to be rich or you have to be connected or you can't run for office. My goal is to empower next generation leaders, no matter their, their lot in life, to say, I can give you the tools. This is not that difficult. And so one of the courses that I will be teaching at, at Cotillia is the, the idea that you know, the waters are calm, come on in, it's okay. And in fact, I believe as human beings, we have a responsibility to give back. We have a responsibility uh, uh, to make the world a better place, to, to look back in the day that we die and say, I believe the world is better because I walked upon it. And because I understand, and I, it is an understanding, that the most powerful entity in any nation on earth is government that if you can take the reins of government and put the, the, the government to good use, you can fundamentally change the world. So, so that's, that's the first piece. I also uh, uh, will teach um, a course on political communication. I developed a kind of a new paradigm of political communication based on my lifetime experiences that is, it, it, it centers around emotion and passion, that human beings uh, we know are very emotive, very passionate, but very often when we give speeches or we do interviews um, or debates, we get very kind of rigid. We get, we, we, we call it actually interview speak, where we think we're supposed to somehow uh, you know, show how smart we are. And, and in fact, we know now that that doesn't connect to people. And over, over the uh, past uh, 15, uh, actually 16 years at, at Harvard, I was able to kind of perfect that. And then working with uh, all these parties and movements around the world, you find that if you can bring emotion and passion to your communication uh, 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 paradigm that you're going to connect much better with, in this case, voters, but it could be anybody, it could be shareholders, could be whatever. So um, I'm excited by it. It's virtually scientific. It, um, uh, I mean, I literally have now trained people in, from virtually every uh, country in the world, and it is universal. And I'm excited to bring it to India again, because I believe India is such a critical player that we have to give next generation 
uh, uh, young people the tools, whether it's here's how you run a campaign or here's how you connect to voters through your communication paradigm. If we can do that and empower them, I think we're going to get a new generation of leaders who understand the importance of service and of giving back and making the world a better place. And I'm glad you mentioned about political communications. Uh, you know, what I'm most excited about is to start the culture of presidential debates in India. We do not bring in uh, the nuances of what the person's going to do once they get elected, right? It's all about browbeating. It's all about shaming the other person. No, it's all about making the campaign dirty across religion lines, right? But they don't talk, talk about how the water is going to reach the house. They don't talk about how electricity is going to reach the house. Our houses are going to be built. It's all about polarization. It's about, you know, my base versus your base, right? And, you know, the floating population often doesn't come out to vote. They're like, okay, let the bases fight. I don't care about either, right? And as, as uh, you know, I was reading the, the analysis of the recently concluded elections, there were six assembly constituencies seats, which actually, uh, you know, people uh, didn't, uh, the, the second in, uh, who came second could not win because the, uh, none of the above got more votes, right? So difference between the first and the second was more, uh, sort less than the none of the above votes, right? So people are actually, you know, so disgruntled that they would rather put none of the above to ensure that their vote uh, at least makes a point. Right. And that's what I'm saying. Like India is a young country under 35, 60% population. And we don't have people like us in the parliament. Right. We have all these old people deciding our fate. They're not scientific. Right. They're using uh, religion as the biggest tool. Right. And people like us are drained out because we don't have the money. We don't have the muscle power. We don't have the legacy. So I think you will teach our students breaking how to break the money. Uh, muscle power and legacy issues and still be in politics, right? The very little uh, communication style, which I know with the animated, the emotions is all because I did your classroom. I teaching for about six months. I was your, you know, EA. So I, you know, uh, learned a lot from you closely, right? And that's what I wish for, for my students, right? How can they, you know, A, learn writing, right? Learn excellent communication from you, right? So they can amplify their voice both form, in both forms. And then they're credible leaders. They understand what mistakes have been made in the past. And that's what you can get from Professor Temkin's classroom. So I think, you know, these three skills in itself are, are you know, going to be enough apart from the economic statistics, negotiations and everything which you'll go through, which will be the core. So I'm really, really excited, right? I, I want to sort of move on to the, 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 you know, my final question here. And I would love to understand you, you've all been, you know, on the other side reading applications, right? So those who are applying right now, what are the mindsets, uh, you know, required to go through a course like Masters in Public Policy, right? Why do you think, who's ready for it, right? What sort of a mindset is ready to undergo this course? And now I'll start with Professor Temkin. Professor Temkin? Well, when I, I mean, there, there's people who work in public policy, there are many ways that they can do it. Okay, so I want that there's no one formula. Uh, and you, you know, at the, for just the model that we have, uh, you know, Steve and I both taught it, uh, teaching at the, at the Kennedy School for a long time, and pe different people want to contribute in different ways, right? And uh, the, whether it's in government, whether it's in civil society, whether it's in, you know, polit you know, running for office, whether it's in the private, there's many different ways in which people can contribute. But if I have to uh, look for two things in common, one is I think, a, you know, a seriousness and a rigor, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't really matter to me personally, like just, you know, where you went to school before, what family you come from, how, mu how much money you have, those things are, you know, I look at uh, potential students as, you know, are you willing uh, to be serious and put in the work, right? And are you really committed to the idea um, of public service, right? And public policy that is serious public policy uh, with the idea of leading, uh, the idea of serving the public. And you, want, you want to do well, you want to succeed in life, you want to you know, thrive in your career, you want to have a well-paying job. Those things, are, those things are great and they're fine. And I think that going to a good public policy school can certainly help you achieve those things. But you want that extra, uh, extra thing where you really understand yourself as part of a larger collective. Okay? So you're not just in it for yourself or even for a small group of people, but you really understand yourself to be part of uh, part of a public. 
So I look for those two things. I look for the seriousness in terms of the, the work that goes into it, but also the attitude, right? The attitude of what it means to go uh, into public service. You know, we say uh, in public, you know, in a good public policy education, we want to look for evidence-based public policy, right? We, 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 we emphasize that, but I want to make something clear about that. Evidence-based doesn't mean only, well, you know, things are, uh, from the sky, you know, there's like uh, mathematical principles and it's free of any kind of bias. That's not what I mean. Evidence, evidence based means that we really make assessments about what kind of public policy really serves the public, right? And I always emphasize, look, we have to be honest with people. We have to be honest with our public, right? They might uh, not like what we have to say. Uh, that you might not be popular. Uh, off the bat, you know, maybe later on in history, you'll be you'll be better, more accepted. But we have to gain the fundamentals, right, of understanding what our purpose is. Why are we going into this kind of work, right? It's not always immediately rewarding, uh, and the reward is sometimes not obvious. All right, so those are the those are the kinds of of, of students that I think I, I really thrive. In a, in a in a public policy program, and I know they're there because you know even even just you know, speaking to people today, I can tell that there's there's this energy out there. Professor Jarding. Well, I I, I certainly agree with with uh, everything that the professor just said. I uh, but I I tell my students that usually on the first day of class I'll say, um, how many in, people in here think that you can be a leader, and. I, you know, even at, at Harvard, it's a, 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 obviously a lot of talented students, but you might be surprised how few hands go up. Um, and, and I say, well, here's, here's, here's my definition of leadership. First of all, it's not genetic. If it was genetic, we'd take a blood test or a urine test when you walked in. If you had the leadership gene, you'd stay in class. And if you didn't, we'd boot you out. But the fact is, there is no leadership gene. Uh, that's good news, because that means that there are 7.5 or whatever it is now, billion potential leaders on planet Earth. And I, I believe that, that leadership is more a, a state of mind. Leadership is, uh, uh, do I understand my responsibility uh, to give back? And so for me, the best students of public policy are those that understand that life is bigger than they are. I, my, my mother uh, uh, told our, I was the youngest of eight kids. And my, my father died when I was four months old and, and we grew up and kind of complained and no, oh, we didn't, you know, we went from kind of upper middle class to lower middle class. We didn't, we didn't have things that, that uh, we used to had when dad was alive. And, and my, my mother sat us down one point and said, you know, I love you guys, but I don't like you. Um, all you do is complain. You think life is about material things. You think life is about what's in it for, for you. She said, the loneliest thing that'll ever happen to you, the worst thing could happen to you is that on the last day that you breathe air on this earth, if you can't look back and say the world is a better place because you walked upon it, she said, it'll be the loneliest day uh, in your life because life is bigger than you. And so for me, the best students of public policy, the best individuals are those who understand that, that the responsibility to give back is, is honorable. It's daunting as can be, but it is honorable. And so people that say, again, I can be that leader. There's no gene. Anyone can be a leader if they choose to be. And so coming to a school where you're given the skills, and I love uh, the uh, Glenn, uh, Professor uh, Glenn, um, as a writer. I was a journalist at a time. I tell my students all the time, I get asked that, if you could say, what should we, what should we do um, to prepare ourselves? I say, learn how to write and learn how to communicate. Uh, if you can do those two things and you understand leadership, you understand your responsibility, we're going to create a whole lot more uh, uh, great uh, public servants. So um, I, th I think the best student that, that is, is one that takes risk, one that says, I'm going to challenge myself to do better. I'm going to challenge myself to be bigger than me. And if you do that, I think the world is your oyster. You can do anything that you want. And that's what I try to instill in my students. I try to say, I'll give you the skills, whether they're communication or how to run a campaign. I'll show you that. But you have to come to the table with the idea that you have a responsibility to give back and you have a responsibility to serve. If you're willing to do that, 
we'll get you to that mountaintop. We'll give you those tools to succeed. And that to me is the core of a great school of public policy. And that's why this is so exciting what you're, what you're producing here and the quality of the professors that I'm on with. I mean, these are two of the best in the world at what they do. And you've, you've brought them together. That is a gift. And uh, very few schools are doing that. You're doing it right. And I think for students that are interested, this is an opportunity to take your rightful place as, as someone in, in the human chain that says, I get it, I'm gonna create a better world. Great, uh, very inspiring as always, Steve. Uh, you know, uh, Professor Glenn, uh, you know, what mindsets is Stanford uh, looking for and what, uh, what have you sort of seen over the years changing in the minds of people who've come to you, uh, you know, uh, from a business perspective? Let's, why should we ignore that, you know, business is not an integral part of public policy, right? How have you shaped the minds of people who come in with a business mindset towards actually going and serving the people? I know one of your students uh, I was talking to uh, is, is right now, uh, you know, working with the Canadian Minister of Information Technology, right, uh, Marco, right? I had a chat with him and, uh, you know, he was telling me that, you know, I, I learned so much from writing, right? I mean, I do that writing of policy briefs every day, right? If I'm not able to convince the stakeholders, right, of, of what my powerful idea is, then even if I'm the best mind, nobody's going to take me seriously, right? So, so what is that mindset you're looking for from across the Western coast, uh, you know, uh, in the U.S. and setting the trend? Pratik, in addition to what Moshik and Steve said about leadership, um, I would say, especially in this world, students need to be constructive rather than destructive. I know in the United States right now, that's one of the biggest problems is that everyone can criticize and very few suggest solutions. So in my business school class, I accept some public policy students because we don't have a public policy school at Stanford, but I want them to be leaders who are constructive. Great, constructivity, uh, you know, leaders were constructive, right? And we, we can all see why we need leaders who are constructive right now rather than being destructive on the opposite side, right? So, so I, I totally understand. Uh, and now I'll quickly move on to the Q&A. We have 15 more minutes and we have a lot of questions lined up. I will ask Saneej, uh, our admissions manager, uh, before sort of I get into the questioning, right? Let me tell you that uh, we're still accepting applications till May 31st. Uh, if you are keen on doing a master's in public policy and uh, are keen to learn from these stalwarts right here in India, right, who are going to be coming and teaching you in Hyderabad, uh, do apply to our Masters in Public Policy program. We have shared the, the website link. We would really, really love to read uh, your applications and see. It's, it's a competitive course. We only have 60 seats. So if you, if you feel you are the next big change maker and you want to get access to one of the best professors in the world right here in India, I would say, please, please, please get, get, get yourself ahead of the curve and apply today. Uh, and now let's, let's uh, take on, uh, you know, the uh, questions. Let's, let's bring Nidhi Varma on first. Nidhi, uh, you have a question which you've already typed. Why don't you come out uh, and ask yourself? Nidhi, go ahead. Sanich, can oh. you bring on Nidhi? Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, Nidhi, yes. go ahead. Great. Um, yeah, first of all, just wanted to say it's been really nice listening to all of you and everything you're about to offer in Kautalya. I think it's a great uh, opportunity for students like us. Uh, my question is mainly to do with a lot of you spoke about becoming great public policy leaders. And while that is the need of the hour, I'm also curious as to know, how do we enable government or support important stakeholders in areas such as health, economics, agriculture, real public policy issues that might require domain expertise? Is that something Kotalia is going to focus on um, within its courses and classes? Um, like how, or maybe my question generally is how does a public policy leader bring together these experts? Are they the experts themselves or do they sort of uh, play a sort of uh, or provide a platform for experts to come together? So that's really think, my question. Really, really wonderful questions, Nidhi. I think uh, you've sort of uh, uh, 
sort of told us, you know, what is required uh, in terms of going ahead and actually making change, right? These are all the tools which you're talking about, right? Writing, communication, uh, leadership, it, it's a tool, right? But what about domain specific knowledge? Uh, Any one of you who would like to sort of come in, you've got, you know, eons of experience of actually training folks to get into domains in public policy. Uh, so please, anyone can sort of start off uh, and answer Nidhi's question. I can I can get us I can get us started. I, I think those things are all fundamental. So, you know, we have been talking so far in a, what I would call an aspirational way, and and defining right the idea of public service, defining the idea of leadership. You know what it means to have solid public policy. Uh, but I think Nidhi is posing a really good question, which is what does that mean in practice for people, people who actually are affected by policy, who are affected by leadership. That happens not just in, uh, you know, in the abstract, but it happens in the domain of health, as we can all see now. It happens in the domain of the eco economic life. It happens in the domain of education, right? Um, and so, yes, I think, um, you know, this is up to the Cotillia leadership, who I fully trust, because they, they I think, really know what is best for a program like this, uh, to have uh, good people who are experts in these fields. And so you can emerge from an MPP program like this you know, having a strong foundation in leadership and in public service, but also being able to say, hey, I really know something about health policy, right? I know something about public health. I know something about economics. I know something about the private sector. And, you know, here is my, my, my claim, right? And I can go in and contribute and you hit, you know, hit the ground running um, after, after graduation. So um, I don't think anybody wants to cut corners. My conception of a really strong public policy program is that it combines the aspirational, right? You want to bring change, you want to create a better society, uh, but with the realistic, because what is it all about really? It's really about making people's lives better, right? Certainly from a crisis moment like the one we're in now, but just, just generally speaking. And so uh, that has to happen in the actual you know, lives that people lead in India and everywhere else. Anybody else wants to chime in? I just have a quick thought. Uh, Nidhi, I think what we're trying to sort of think about public policy education is that once you've given you, you know, tools in the first year, built your core, right, given you all the skills in the first year, we leave it to you to pick your own specialization. And it's our job to provide your domain experts in that, right? I mean, we can't sort of, uh, you know, obviously we'll have experts in agriculture, economics, health and education and stuff. These are the public policy issues which you look at, right? But we, what, what we are stressing about here is once you have a strong core, which is ready in the first year, we all went through core at MPP, right? Uh, you know, uh, Professor Jarding's campaign management course is an elective. It's not a core subject, right? I wanted to focus on campaign management. Hence, I did the course on campaigns, right? Writing was an elective course, right? Which I did that. But I think what is required is once you get your core skills in, of what it actually means to be uh, in the public policy domain, I think you can specialize uh, and go on uh, and do what, you know all these uh, areas that you sort of mentioned and be successful. Pratik, if I may add that one reason you go to Cotillia is to build a network. So you aren't always the authority on the subject. You need to know more than the general public. But, but really what you can do is you can build a network where if you don't know the answer, then you can talk to the people you met at Cotillia and through your network and figure out together the best answer. Great. Yeah, the other thing I would add, and I agree with, with Glenn entirely, I, uh, the network is so critical. And in politics, networking is, is uh, it, it, unbelievably critical because you just need it. You cannot be an expert on all the major issues of the day. It's not a possibility for one person to be an expert in, in 500 different areas. And in fact, one of the six main reasons people say in surveys worldwide that they do not get into elective public services, they say, I'm not an expert on the issues. And one of the things that I try to ch train through the, the course and messaging is you don't have to be. Certainly, Cotillia is offering the opportunity to, to take uh, policy uh, courses in, and become an expert in a certain area, but don't feel that you have to be an expert because you don't. You will surround yourself with people who do. You will network with people you do. Don't let that be an excuse for not getting into public service uh, because, again, you don't have to. You'll have the luxury at Cotillia to, to 
pick an area of policy. Uh, and that's wonderful. And you should do that. But do not think, I, I, if I'm not an expert in every area, I shouldn't get involved in, in public service. No one is an expert. Um, you can't be in every area. So don't let that become an excuse. Don't let that become uh, something that you fear. Go ahead and embrace it because your network and your capacity to attract expertise uh, in the public arena is going to be there. That is, will not be an issue. Great. Uh, hope Nidhi, uh, you've got the answer you were looking for. Uh, let, let's bring on Jasmeet uh, now uh, and Jasmeet, uh, you know, keep your questions short and, uh, you know, to the point so that we can have many more people answer, uh, uh, you know, get their questions answered. Jasmeet. Yeah. Hi, sir. Hi, panelists. Hope you're doing good. So my question is, uh, what was missing in the Indian public policy space or uh, what was missing in the colleges or universities that were offering courses in public policy in India that Cotillia uh, wants to bridge and uh, that is different What that is different from other universities? What is one that one thing that is different from other policies, schools in India? I think one thing top of my hand is the kind of professors uh, and the board we have. I think uh, in public policy, these experts, these stalwarts are... are uh, you know, I wish they were there. I, I wish the best for the other schools as well. We need an ecosystem of schools uh, who are top class. I mean, uh, there is Princeton, there is uh, Columbia, there is Harvard, there is Stanford, there is Brown, there is Berkeley, right? We, we don't want to be the only school. And I wish other schools also have access to top quality professors. But just meet, uh, if, if I was to answer your question, I think the access uh, to top quality minds uh, is was missing. And, and the way we are only focused on finance and math and economics in our policy domains, uh, you know, was, was one thing which was holding us back, according to me. And But I'd love to hear uh, the panelists, uh, you know, and tell us more about what is it that you think we're doing differently here? Um, I'd say we all need to be world citizens. And embracing talent from around the world is increasingly important because we need to speak a common language. Great. Yeah, I would just add, I, I one of the things that I liked about uh, what Pratik and, and the other leaders were putting together is my experience at Harvard was that students said, we love the economics, we love the policy, but we want practitioners. I love the fact that we have one, a leading expert on leadership uh, who's going to teach leadership. That's that's a practical issue. Uh, Glenn teaching writing, that is a practical issue. Students want that. They need that. Hopefully the stuff I teach in communication and campaign management, those are things you very often don't get in schools of public policy because they tend to become a little more for lack of a better term, academic in nature than, than uh, providing practical skills. And I think that is critical to, to the success of a student is to be given the skills to write, to lead, to communicate. If you have those and then you supplement that with policy, I, I think you've got a unique experience and Caltelia gives that. And I don't know that many schools, uh, uh, certainly in India or around the world do that. Great. Uh, let's let's uh, bring on Vanchika uh, and uh, Professor Temkin. Maybe you can ask, answer Vanchika's question since you already have the answer, Vanchika. Or Teja, if Teja is around, Teja, you can. Um, Vanchika, go ahead. Good evening, panelists. Uh, there, actually, I have the first of all, thank you for this wonderful session. Uh, while, while you were all talking about this, I have three questions of my, in mind, if you would all allow me to question. Uh, so the first question that I have is, as you mentioned that India was one of the economies in the past. And so uh, as per my uh, limited knowledge that I have, India is great dependent on its middle income group. But so currently, as we see in, in the Indian scenario, our government doesn't put much emphasis on the schemes that uh, they that support the middle class. So I want to know what is your perspective of uh, supporting the uh, lower income group versus supporting the middle class in a in the economies like India. My second question to you is, uh, while you were uh, emphasizing on the fact that nobody can be a specialist, I completely agree, sir. But sir, in uh, in the Indian model of administration, so as per my knowledge, again, I've seen that there are a few posts where the whole district administration is in the hand of one person who is majorly the supreme authority. He might not have any background in the respective field, but then all the all the areas pertaining to the district's administration are under his 
main authority so in that case uh, especially when it comes to managing uh, crisis like corona that we have the pandemic uh, we have seen that we have failed so so there uh, the journalist uh, there my question is that in respect to this that should the head of the particular department or a particular state not be one person but a team uh, having multiple members having some at least some experience of the thing because as i have seen uh, medical professionals were not uh, really consulted by uh, dealing with the particular district that is what i have observed sir and lastly sir my question is that while we are talking about uh, political uh, campaigns and other stuff so we have to keep in mind that the in, that india even though it's the largest democracy it doesn't have the voters who are well informed or who know the importance of a vote in general our voters are largely driven by their needs their needs like food and other stuff so even if somebody gives them uh, like uh like attracts them by giving them a, a food item or anything they'll vote in his favor so when our voters are so you know not aware how will you uh how will any person who knows administration uh, or public policy uh make a good leader because what people want is something they don't Achha, understand. i i i we've got a, i think i'll have to cut you yeah, short sorry, sir, this, but 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 that's the problem with indian students right that's what we were hinting we cannot be concise and brief about what we want to ask so i i really would uh, like like your thought process but we need to be concise in a uh, you know in a session like this uh, yeah. professor steve uh, glen uh, Tem professor tem can go ahead you can answer the question Well, so uh, I, maybe I'll, I'll get it started. Look, I think there, there's a reason why uh, Vanchika actually brought up all these things, right? There are a lot of public problems that uh, people are concerned with, especially young, young, conscientious people who are interested in, in good public policy. Um, and I heard one thing I heard is, is how do we support vulnerable people? How do we support people who are not well off, right? If we if we feel that the powers that be are only concerned with you know the the those who are let's say wealthier than others and and they don't uh, have a good sense of you know the social foundations of of the public, yes, that's something that I think a good public policy school really needs to to address. For me. Uh, learning about good public policy, learning about public service and leadership is really about protecting and helping people who need it the most, right? Uh, uh, there are people who might not need our help as much, and we we have a responsibility, right, to those who are not as fortunate as we are, and that's at least how I see the ethos of a uh, of, of a place like this. And some of the other issues that came up are, you know, corruption and and incompetence and. people voting out of you know not uh, fully informed in the political system look you know the india is a huge country uh, this uh, program is new okay and all great things start with the first step all right so nothing is going to be solved over overnight i don't think anybody should claim that there is like a magic bullet here that things can be like done oh, but you have to build a foundation how do you get an electorate that is well informed about the system right how do you make people making good decisions right how do you create a, a a society in which people don't aren't forced to vote in order to get the basic food that they need for their fa family right those are the sorts of things that i believe that people coming in from different directions they learn about right they're exposed to these ideas they talk to each other and then they formulate policy out of it okay and these are things that you know you take time to build but you really are in good hands here with people who are i think well placed to do it and well educated well trained um you're getting the right kind of faculty in uh and you know you have to kind of like just you have to give this a chance because you know if you want to be able to address all these different problems i think this is the way to go great uh, vanchika uh, i hope we were able to give you an answer uh, we really hate to cut you short but uh, it's just that the, there are too many questions and i want to take one last question before we let up and let's go uh, ravi teja go ahead uh, if you want to come in uh, now and ask, ask a question fine uh, see, actually i have one question so uh, do you have any remembrances from your experiences of your graduate who is currently working as an individual consultant after completing the public policy and i would like to know what kind of businesses they are engaged in so if you remember from your uh, uh, bunch of students then is it where is it work uh, in uh, in india so can i work as an individual consultant in india after completion great, of this graduation great we got a question uh, so the question is very simple what are your students doing in india right let's let's hear it from and that's a good way to end 
Uh, you've taught so many Indian students, and what are they doing in India? I, I will start because it's such a wonderful question. You want to see what are the results? Um, President Bharat of Kaltulya was my student. He never finished the last assignment. I keep kidding him about that because he went back to India. But look what he's doing. He's building a university that's going to change India. That's why I think Steve Moshek and I love teaching is, is students like President. I now call him President Bharat. Great. Steve, what are your students doing in India? Well, uh, good things. I mean, I, I, I was on at Harvard, I was on the admissions uh, uh, committee for I think it was five years, and I was on the subcommittee on India, and the students are fabulous. And I've got students that I communicate with to this day from India, that are working in business that are working in government that are working in education to try to create a better India. Um, I'm proud that uh, many of my students, not just in India, by the way, but I, I have hundreds of students, uh, former students that are, have run for office and run successfully. I have a, uh, one of my former students was just elected prime minister in Mongolia. I've got 11 former students running for president or prime minister. Um, giving people the skills to succeed will percolate up. And so, uh, yeah, I'm proud of, of the, the students from India that I've had, including Pratik, obviously, uh, you know, helping found this university. Um, uh, it, it just, th that's how it begins. And Glenn said, you know, kind of one, you know, the, 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 the tidal wave begins with one small ripple. And uh, if we can create some small ripples, we're going to create a tidal wave to change the world. I just believe that. I've seen it happen, not just in India, but around the world. And that's the best we can do. It's not, this isn't gonna be a grand crescendo that the school starts and pretty soon, you know, overnight, India changes, but it will change. It will, we will help develop next generation leaders who a generation from now will be reading about how they're changing India and changing the world. And we should all take pride in that and want to be a part of it. Great, uh, Professor Temkin, you can have the last word. Yeah, I mean, the list is the list is long. Uh, so uh, I also had Pratik, uh, the pleasure to have Pratik as, as my student. And I think he's a great model for, you know, what you can do you. So it's, it's not, for me, it's certainly, look, it's clear that people uh, want to have uh, good, you know, successful uh, careers. They want to have a good life. Uh, the, you, you, you want to be able to feed your family. You want to be able to, to, to advance. That, that, that is a very basic thing. I don't, and I don't think we should ignore that. Um, but, if, but people do it in all sorts of ways. They do it in government. They do it in civil society. They do it in business. They, they, you know, they do it in all kinds of domains. If I had to look for a common thread, I think, students that I had, when they go back to India, they try to think big, right? They try to think about how to change things, not just how to settle down, not just about how to, you know, make a living, well, that's important, but also how to transform, how to be dynamic, right? How to create something. Um, and that can be in all different domains, right? And not only that, they think big, within India, but also as understanding something that Steve referred to earlier, which is India's place in the world, right? India, uh, an extremely important country. So India also has relationship with the rest of the world, right? What, what is India uh, and the United States, India and China, India and international institutions, right? India isn't just inside India, it's also outward. And I think in the next few months, we're going to see that more and more because the world is going to become increasingly interested in what's happening in India. Right, so um, I think that is something that we can we can really leave a mark on, which is that you when you study with these kinds of faculty, when you study in this kind of program, you are building a life for yourself as a in public policy, but you're also learning how to be a better citizen, stronger citizen, and also a global citizen. Great. Uh, I think uh, you've said it, uh, you know, uh, Professor Temkin, nobody could have sort of ended it in a better way, ending on a note that you can be a better person and a better leader and you can make a better country, right? I just want to end by saying, uh, folks, uh, you know, I came back from United States, uh, you know, uh, left a cushy job at the World Bank, uh, you know, in DC uh, and wanted to come back and, you know, run political campaigns here. 
work on education policy on gender you know start uh, you know uh, kautalya right and i also sort of started a public policy think tank called citizens public leadership right so i think what what we are trying to give you is knowledge skills and networks right building your foundation and then we leave it leave you to decide you know you have all the network you have all the access you've got you know uh, you know everything uh, under control right now is the time for you to shine right so once you leave the nest of kautalya we ex expect you to be this giant you know uh, you know uh, birds flying really high up in the air and you know also being grounded at the same time and ensuring real work happens on the ground so that's that's what we envisage from all of you and and you know at kautalya I, i'll just end we're looking for the best minds and the best hearts right i feel best minds without the best hearts cannot change the world and certainly cannot make an impactful career right career choices for 60 of you who are joining at kautalya will not be you know uh, you know and a sort of a thing to worry about because you know what we are trying to create here is the world should chase you you should not chase world for a job right that's how empowered we want to create uh, you know these this first batch of kautalya students right and what we really expect uh, over the next two years from this degree is to really transform the way not only how public policy education is offered in india but how any university should offer masters uh, degree to its students right i want to leave uh, by saying that you know my line uh, you know is that mpp is the new mba right the next best jobs and the next set of most impactful jobs are going to be for the mpp professionals in india right and i say this with absolute responsibility right with absolute command over uh, what i've learned in the last uh, decade or so being in this field and learning from these stalwarts right i don't think these stalwarts are available in any other school you know though though i wish that you know once we've taken the step of opening a ivy league school in india more such schools offer such high quality public policy education in india but but thank you so much i know this is a tough time for everybody including our panelists including me personally you know we are all battling personal loss uh, and personal crisis but we also feel that this is the time to wake a nation up from its slumber right that you guys need to take charge you guys need to take charge of the identity of this nation the future of this nation and you deserve to learn from the best right i hope most of you will uh, you know apply it's a competitive course we have less number of seats i know the criticism this course could have been offered at scale but we really really want to produce the 60 of india's best public policy professionals with this batch and that's what our endeavor is and i hope most of you will be there in the class come august right thank you so much for joining in have a good evening and thank you so much to our panelists for taking out this precious time at this crucial hour namaste and good night